is the Mike Smith Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Here we go with the great fracking debate in British Columbia. Hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, very controversial. Of course, it's the method to extract natural gas from the ground. A big industry in British Columbia set to expand with the new LNG Canada plant coming online. Uh, but a new campaign underway now to ban fracking in the province. It's called Planet on Fire and Fracking in B.C. It's a campaign by the Wilderness Committee. Let's discuss now. we got both sides of it for you. It's Peter McCartney on the line. He's a climate campaigner with the Wilderness Committee. I'm pleased to welcome him back to the show. Peter, thanks for doing this. Hey, you bet. Thanks for having me. Okay, also on the line is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of Resource Works. He supports fracking in the LNG industry. Hey, Stuart. Mike. Thanks a lot for coming on, guys. Peter, let me go to you first. Tell me about this campaign. Yeah, so uh, it's a campaign we've been working on for a while, uh, but we're going hard at it this year uh, because of new information that shows, you know, the oil and gas industry is the single largest uh, polluter, more than more so than all other industry combined in British Columbia. And it's also the one that's increasing. Uh, emissions have gone up 8% from that industry since 2007, uh, while declining by 4% across the board uh, in the other industries. So there's two sections, two things that we're asking for. Um, the first one is an immediate end to fossil fuel subsidies. You know, these, these fracking companies are surviving off of massive public handouts from the provincial government. Um, we found that 14 out of 15 of the top fracking companies in BC ended up uh, receiving more in fracking drilling credits uh, then they actually paid in taxes and royalties to the provincial government, which, you know, I, it's just unacceptable that we're subsidizing the most polluting industry in British Columbia. So what, would, what would happen if you canceled those subsidies? Would they just pack up and leave? Uh, you know, I think drilling would stop. Um, you know, the, the existing gas that is already being produced would, of course, keep going. But, yeah, if you, if you cancel these subsidies, the, the idea is that, um, you know, we're not subsidizing pollution into creation. We can, uh, we can sort of use some of the resource revenues uh, that the province is bringing in. How many, how many, peop how many people would lose their jobs? So there's, there's about 8,000 people who work in fracking oh. in BC. Um, there's certainly, you know, that's, that's a lot of people, and we need to figure out what to do with them. But it's not <laughs> insurmountable. We can, we can figure that out. You know, okay. early retirement and, uh, you know, retraining for folks that are younger in the industry can easily transition this industry over the next several decades. Okay, let me go to Stuart Muir. Stuart, your thoughts. Yeah, you, you know, I think in terms of the, the government perspective, you look at the revenues that go to the B.C. government, it, it's been quite... Uh, a benefit to BC to have a healthy industry. And although uh, Pete incorrectly uses the term subsidies, we're, we're talking about a royalty program that actually incentivizes investment and the deep well credits that uh, are being talked about, which actually are going to be reviewed. You know, the BC government in the last uh, election committed to a review of royalties. So that's happening. But you look at deep well credits, they've, for a, quite a small investment, what Pete calls a subsidy, but as I say, it's an incentive. They, they created $90 billion worth of gas investment in D.C., and that would have gone to Alberta or someone else, somewhere else. Uh, $24 billion in government revenues from that. I would say it's closer to 10,000 jobs, not 8,000. And that, those are jobs, not just any jobs. They've got the highest average wage in any industry. And it's okay, also the most innovative and high-tech industry. So do you want to keep it or lose it? And that's really what Pete is, I think, asking. Okay, let's talk about that high-tech industry. And, and Peter, you, you tell me if, you know, let's talk about what fracking is. Basically, you drill down into the ground. You, you put down high-pressure water mixture down there to crack the shale rock, and it, re, it releases the natural, natural gas, right? I mean, that's just kind of a Coles Notes version of it. But what, what is wrong with that? What is the environmental impact of that? I mean, the environmental impact on the landscape is pretty massive. Uh, you know, the, the fracking industry and all of the access roads, you know, well pads, everything they have actually, um, I think, four or five times the size of Alberta's tar sand mines. Uh, so the landscape impacts are huge. They use a massive amount of water, half a million water trucks a year. But really, for me, the biggest impact is on the climate. You know, these, these fracking wells and all the infrastructure, the valves, um, you know, they're not perfect, and they leak methane gas into the atmosphere, which is a huge issue because methane gas is 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a global warming uh, gas over its right. lifetime. And so, you know, every time we look and try and study the amount of methane that's coming from northeast BC, it ends up being higher than industry and government previously reported. Stuart, um, Stuart what do you... For about a quarter of global warming, and, and we, need mm. to, uh, we need to tackle it. Stuart, what do you say to that? 
Yeah, the, the direction of government right now and, and industry together is to green up that natural gas because it is the lowest profile GHGs of any fossil fuel. And that's why companies, especially on the other side of the Pacific, are lining up for Canadian gas because it's not just Canada that has climate concerns. It's every country in the world. And so Korea, Taiwan, India, why do they want gas from Canada? They want gas from Canada because they can lower their GHGs and they have fast growing economies, they desperately need it. But you know, on the environmental side, who isn't concerned with the environment? Uh, the Supreme Court of BC, they, they were asked a few years ago to rule on, on fracking. And here's what the judge justice came out with, um, that water protection was transparent. It was in the hands of science-based regulations. A creditable job in, had been done in protecting the environment. And only, here's a stat for you, and I'll, and I'll stop after that, Mike. In BC, just 0.006% of water permits were for fracking. That's it. Okay. Any proportion. Okay. Speaking of Peter McCartney and Stuart Muir about fracking in British Columbia, the Wilderness Committee has a new banned fracking campaign. So, Stuart, or, or uh, Peter, let me ask you about the LNG Canada project, which has been called the biggest private sector investment in, in the history of Canada, a $40 billion project. Where, what is the status of that project? And are you saying, like, if you had your way and you banned fracking, that project would be dead, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it may be the largest investment, but it's also the largest polluter. And the truth is, you know, LNG Canada at full build-out will create more carbon pollution than every passenger vehicle in British Columbia. And so we're going to have to work a lot harder, spend a lot more money, and likely not even going to be able to meet the province's climate goals um, because but, of this one project being brought online. And but that's isn't unacceptable it, to me. But isn't it cleaner than the coal they would otherwise be burning in China? We sell it to them? It's not. You know, it's, I, I want to debunk this talking point that started in Christy Clark's, uh, you know, former Premier Christy Clark's office. It's a PR. Well, the, the NDP it's, it's says the same thing. Nothing to do with science. The they, NDP says the, the same gas, thing. Anyway. The gas Good. that's being exported to these countries is not going to replace coal. Um, it's actually competing with renewables for new electricity generation. So if anything, it's uh, potentially pricing out wind and solar. Um, you know, it could just as easily be going to Japan to replace nuclear. But regardless of these, you know, creative carbon accounting that industry and government want to do here, the UN says that we have to reduce uh, gas production globally by 3% a year for the next 10 years in order to maintain a safe climate. So okay. it, do it doesn't matter where you're where you're sending it, we need to be having less gas, not more. Stuart, Stuart Muir. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think if you look at our neighbors to the south, they've gone into natural gas in a big way. All of the greenhouse gas improvements in the U.S., which are considerable, are because of natural gas. And that natural gas is almost entirely fracked. So it, it's, a, it's a myth that uh, gas is not part of a cleaner energy pathway. You know, is it the perfect solution? Is it the unobtainium uh, that would solve all of humanity's problems on energy without any side side effects? No, we have to, I suppose, keep looking for that. But but uh, for now, we have something that is reliable, affordable, environmentally sound. It allows others to achieve progress, and it creates benefits. You know, in the last uh, three years. Uh, our health budget in BC went up by three billion dollars a year. That's that's uh, money that has to be found somewhere. I mean, do you want higher taxes, lower services, or do you want to have the government getting revenues from things that are realistic, like gas? Okay, There's guys, here's a billion dollars worth of tax credits for fracking companies on the books right now. Okay, guys, let me jump in there. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk more with our panel, Peter McCartney from the Wilderness Committee, Stuart Muir from Resource Works, and we're talking about the natural gas business in British Columbia, the fracking industry, uh, the LNG Canada mega project, $40 billion, the biggest in Canadian history. On the line here, uh, the Wilderness Committee campaigning to ban fracking and, and shut that project down. So let's open the phone lines on it now and phone me and tell me what you think. Maybe you work in this business. I'd love to hear from you if you work in the fracking uh, industry or the oil and gas sector. Call me and tell me what it's like. 604-280-9898 is the number. 604-280-9898. Star 9898, toll free on your cell. This is Mike Smith, back with your calls after this. Welcome back to our fracking debate, Stuart Muir and Peter McCartney. Let's go right to your phone calls here. Uh, we got lots of them, Max and Delta. Hey, Max. Hey, guys, how's it going today? Good. Good. Um, I, 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 I don't want to come across like an extremist on either side. Um, 
I've worked in the fracking industry, and I've seen firsthand uh, the chemicals that we pump down um, a well, anywhere from, say, one to 5,000 meters. And it, the, the stuff that comes back up is called process water. And it is, in, I mean, I'm no chemist, I'm no scientist, but it's single-handedly the most toxic substance that is in open air around humans. So let's get that out of the way. I want to qualify that. To the gentleman that, that's against natural gas, yeah. we have nearly 8 billion people on this planet, and we're already struggling to meet the power grid needs for, for everyone. Yeah. Um, in my line of work, which is irrelevant, well, it's not irrelevant, but it's, it's irrelevant to the conversation. My line of work, complaining without a solution is just bitching for the sake of bitching. And you cannot sit there and say that wind and solar are the be all end all for 8 billion people on this planet. Now, just to qualify myself even more, I now work in so called hydroelectricity, clean energy. Yeah. And believe me when I tell you, it is anything but. At the height of one project that I was on, we burned 100,000 liters of diesel per day just to keep the engines warming and the heaters going. So where is this clean energy going to come from? Okay, Max, very interesting call. Thank you for phoning in. Uh, Peter McCartney. Yeah, I mean, the good news about wind and solar is that they're cheaper than gas. Uh, the levelized cost of energy for wind and solar is about 42 43 bucks. Uh, and for a combined cycle gas turbine plant, it's 58 bucks a kilowatt hour. Um, so the truth is we can do this. We are doing this. Um, the renewables plus like backup battery storage where, uh, you know, we find ways to store energy and use it more efficiently with smart grids. That's the future uh, for all 8 billion people on the planet. And well, the truth is natural gas is just going to become this really, really expensive backup fuel. But you can't turn off the switch on fossil fuels overnight. Of course right? you can't, you know, it's, yeah. and we're not asking for that. We're saying, hey, we need a plan. We have, we have a couple years to do this, um, but tell, give us an end date. If you well, agree I mean, that this industry isn't going to exist in 30 years, tell us how we're going to get there. Okay, well, you're saying you're, you're not calling for the, to switch off the, turn off the switch, but you're calling for a $40 billion project that's under construction right now to, to be shut down. But let me, let me go to Stuart Muir and get his thoughts real quickly. Stuart. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a country, we hear a lot about Germany and their energy win. They put in like billions, hundreds of billions of investment into uh, green energy. And I'm a fan of all of that, by the way, all forms of energy. Sure. Um, what are they doing right now after years of wind turbines, which are working for them? Um, it's not enough. And so they're working with Russia to finish the, uh, the new pipeline coming from Siberia to bring all that gas to Germany. They need natural gas. And it's, it's just a myth that there is a sort of, you know, off switch on fossil fuels. There isn't. We're going to need them really for the foreseeable future. Yes, mm -hmm. we will, through technology, reduce their impacts because those impacts are real. Okay, Brian and Anasis Island, hi. Oh, hey, listen, everybody stole my thunder about that, but I'm going to just suggest to your environmentalist that he gets a, a book called False Alarm, written by a Swedish guy. I forget his name. He's on YouTube. And he yeah. does cost-benefit analysis to programs, right? Like, for example, when we had a pollution problem in California, what did we do? We invented catalytic converters. Problem okay. solved. Okay, the guy you're speaking... Yeah. You know, I mean, we live in Canada. We have to heat our homes and in the winter. And look at how that worked out for Texas. Okay, so, thank, thank you for the call. The guy you're thinking of is Bjorn Lomborg, um, who's an interesting guy. Okay, Peter, your thoughts? Look, uh, I mean, I, I honestly have no time for people that say climate change is, uh, is not a giant crisis that is existential. Um, and we, we absolutely, every world expert agrees, you know, the UN committees have said, we have to get this under control. Um, and, you know, yeah, we have to heat our homes, but there's homes in Alberta where it was like minus 40 degrees uh, that survived completely without fossil fuels. They're, you know, passive houses, um, you know, electric heat pumps. We can do this. And, and if we do this, it is going to save us, A, a ton of money and be a ton of lives. Okay, let's go to Kevin on the line in Vancouver. Hi, Kevin. Hey, thanks for taking my call. So, I, you know what, right on the get-go, I agree that uh, fracking is nasty. I, I personally think burning any fossil fuels is nasty. Um, where I'm going with this, though, is what your other callers have uh, said is, 
Um, I don't think it's realistic. I'm looking at the clouds right now. I can't run my home off of solar um, year round. I mean, we get a small amount of sun here in BC. Um, worldwide, you, you can't run everything off of solar and wind. I've tried. I've tried wiring my home. I've added solar. I can charge my phone. It, it's not realistic to simply cut fossil fuels. And I'd much rather what your other guest was saying. Transition. While you transition, okay, what, Peter, what do you say to him? You know, you can look at the studies yourself. Stanford University has done an energy profile about how every single country on the planet could go 100% renewable. Um, the truth is we, we don't have much fossil fuels on our grid here in BC already, for better or worse. You know, we built hydro dams instead of coal plants. And yeah. so, you know, we, we're ahead in the race of, uh, you know, reducing carbon pollution. And uh, we just have to double down on that. Okay, Frank and Surrey on the line. Hey, Frank. We just got a minute left. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Uh, uh, Peter, global warming, it was called. Then it was climate change. Then a climate emergency. Now the voice is even shriller. It's climate crisis. Now tell me, CO2 is an essential gas for life on Earth, but you continually refer to CO2 as a pollutant. You know, given that every person exhales a kilogram of CO2 every day, and given that WCB allows uh, workers to be exposed to 4,000 parts per million in an eight-hour day. So okay, Peter. CO2 is a pollutant. Peter, 30 seconds. You know, there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere right now that we are warming the planet. It's already warmed 1.1 degree, and we're on track for three unless we change things. And the B.C. NDP government, if they want to tackle climate change here in B.C., needs to pull the rug out from under this industry and stop giving them the okay. massive public giveaways that enable them to continue polluting. I want to thank both of you guys for being here once again. Peter McCartney from the Wilderness Committee, thank you. Stuart Muir from Resource Works, thanks for a really good discussion. We had lots of phone calls there. We couldn't get to all of them, so if you didn't get through, you know what to do. Phone the buzz line. Leave me a voicemail there. We may play it later. 604-331-BUZZ.